We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? Very thankful to be back here at Midwestern. Jason, thank you for allowing me to be the warm-up for Al tomorrow in chapel. I appreciate that. Although I know that I'm in a seminary, so I need to say Dr. Allen and Dr. Moeller, forgive me for that, but it is good to be here with you today. And just to share with you a little bit about this phase of life, very briefly, had the privilege to pastor a church in North Atlanta, was actually a church planner there meeting in a doctor's office in North Atlanta and staying there 38 years. And at the end of that time, when I was sure God was calling me to hand off Johnson Fury to a younger man, Ann and I were headed to vacation and she looked at me and said, what are you going to do? She knew that I enjoy leading in ministry and I kind of smiled. I said, I don't know, honey. She said, well, I know this. I know how much you love leadership and I don't want to be the whole focus of your leadership. And so we laughed about that, and when I was carrying bags into that vacation home, Paul Chitwood, the president of the IMB, called, and the man who had been leading their relief, compassion-type ministry, BGR, was retiring, and he wanted to go in a little different direction and have a person out preaching in the seminaries, the colleges, the churches, kind of carrying the banner of that ministry, and then he talked to Kevin Izzell about perhaps joining together where Southern Baptists would have one relief and compassion ministry that they could go to. And that's how Sin Relief began in March of 2020. Y'all might remember the week because it was the week that the whole world shut down because of COVID. What an interesting way to begin a new role in ministry. But our role is really simply to serve the churches in carrying out Christ's great commission through ministries of compassion. And there are a lot of ways we do that, and you can go to sinrelief.org to see about that. But today, in light of our world situation, I want to look at a passage that's not what I would call a traditional mission text, but a text that really speaks to where we're living right now in this season in 2022. So I want to ask if you'll turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 25 that really are probably the lesser known verses of this great chapter where Romans 8, 28 following is so well known. But Romans 8 verses 18 through 25, and here's our theme today. It is hope amidst earth pains. So to honor the Lord and His Word, would you stand now for the reading of God's Word in Romans 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we also ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as the sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we await eagerly for it. Father God, 
May you speak today by the power of you, the Holy Spirit, teaching us and convicting us from your word in a way that we see Jesus clearer than ever before as we seek to understand the difficulties of the world in which we live. And we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been a tough stretch the last couple of years. None of us, two years ago this very month, would have imagined that COVID would still be lingering, and we hope, we hope, at last, it is on its last leg of having major impact in our everyday life. But it's not just COVID, it's all the uneasiness that people have faced and not being able to plan and not knowing what was going to happen and economic ups and downs. And then in the midst of that, near the end of COVID, as we thought it was winding down, we saw the end of the Afghanistan war, devastating end. Scenes on the cameras that were showing people clinging to airplanes, desperate to flee the terrorism in which they would live now. And now, in recent days, this evil autocrat by the name of Putin has invaded Ukraine on what he calls a peacekeeping mission, the ultimate example of how the devil is the father of lies and taking words and using them in a way that is really the opposite of the truth and reality. And once again, we face economic uncertainties and what is going to happen not only there in the Ukraine, but in all of Europe. And we see those mothers and children fleeing now over a million and a half refugees into Poland, into places around the Ukraine. And we realize if there is one bad move on the part of the president of the United States or the president or leader of one of the NATO nations, this could become a catastrophic crisis for the world as it is right now in the Ukraine. This passage from the Word of God speaks to where we're living with the uneasiness and anxiety of our age. And I want to begin in verse 19 of this passage where the Word of God says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Now understand this, it was not always this way. There was a time when all was right. And if you go back to Genesis 1 and 2, you will find that God not only says of his creation that it is good, but he says at the end of chapter 1, it is very good. And it really was good. There was complete harmony, not only among mankind, as we see the description of the creation of Eve to go along with Adam in chapter 2, but we also see that there was harmony in the animal kingdom. There was no killing. When you read or see a National Geographic special and sees one animal preying on another and it just talks about how this is the natural order, no, it is not. That was not what God had in mind. All of the animal kingdom was in harmony with one another and man was in harmony with the animals. And man was living in paradise with the perfect job and mankind had the perfect marriage. All was well, because man was also in harmony with God. But then man sinned, and when that occurred, all of a sudden there was immediate spiritual death that would precede a long, drawn-out physical death. There was separation from God that we read about in chapter 3 of Genesis. And with that came, for the first time, Guilt, shame, cover-up, a mindset of victimization that man took on to blame others for his fall into sin. 
And there was a great anxiety all of a sudden in the midst of all of creation. And Scripture doesn't tell us this. This is my spiritual imagination. But I just sense for the first time in all of history in the animal kingdom, there was a sudden shudder, a sense of fear, a fear of man, a fear of one another. And this anxiety and this uneasiness extended all through creation. And so we see verse 19 describing this, this anxious longing of the creation, waiting eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. And we know how the world refers to all mankind as children of God. If there is any belief in God, and we know theologically that is not the case, but that is the longing that occurs within creation. Look at verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Now, understand, with the original sin, there was not only this breakdown of the harmony and peace on earth and all in sync with one another, but now there is disharmony. And there is disharmony in the sexes. And there is an unrealistic view that Eve, the wife, would have about the love and attention of her man. There would be an unrealistic longing for that man. And because he becomes so wrapped up in his work that has been a wonderful gift of God before the fall of man, now so much of work is futility. Because the harder man works the less results and fruit seem to result. And then there came floods and famines and droughts and recessions and depressions. And this this longing, this uneasiness, and this sense of futility that occurred for all of creation. Because storms and tornadoes and hurricanes and floods and droughts, that was not the original plan but it was the result of man's fall into sin. But the word goes on that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption, from the freedom to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, this longing began to occur within mankind that the world could be a better place because here's something your non-Christian friends will agree with you on. They will say to you, The world as we see it today is not as things ought to be. But the world without God seeks to come up with solutions to this dilemma. And the world without God begins to have these utopian visions of how the corruption to the creation and all the world order can end. And let's just think about it in modern history. You go back to the Revolutionary War, there was understandable outrage by those in the colonies at the craziness of King George III and his tyrannical rule that was deeply resented, and so there was a desire to make a new nation, and we are the beneficiary of some incredible geniuses of our founding fathers who did at least recognize man's original sin, even if they were not all believers. But that was shortly followed by the French Revolution. That was a totally secular move, very little acknowledgement of God. Actually, the church was largely blamed for the troubles there, and so there was a utopian vision that could occur there. Go to the 20th century, 1917, you see the communist revolution and this idea that man could bring about utopia through economic equality, forced economic equality. It didn't work out so good. Then Adolf Hitler came with his vision of the Third Reich, And how all of Europe could be united under his fascist rule. And it cost about 50 million lives in the process, not to mention the Holocaust to the Jews, perhaps the greatest example of man's evil in all of history. And then in the 60s, when I was a child and a teen, we experienced what was called the sexual revolution to bring about total freedom. And I know millennials, you millennials and Gen Z, you feel like you're so distinct from the boomers, but you're really very mild compared to what we were in our teenage and college years. Because you want to see great change, we wanted to tear everything down, just explode it all. Because after all, we could bring about a new world, a new order. It didn't work out so good. And now the most recent utopian ideology that has become the dominant 
ideology and value system in American culture is called political correctness. It involves a wokeness. It involves a cancel culture. It is really the culture of shame that is being developed. The, the intention is good to end discrimination, but because it is so man-made, this ideology, all that has resulted is shame and rejection and division and hostility in culture like never before. It is dominant. No longer is the Judeo-Christian morality or value system the dominant ethic. This is the dominant ethic in American culture. But all of these, all of these have a utopian vision as man is seeking to end the corruption that goes all the way back to original sin to where all the so-called children of God can experience a glorious time together. But you read on in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Now think about how descriptive this is. Think about when you groan, you are groaning over something that is either so physically painful, so emotionally painful, so devastating and here in the news. You know, I, I literally was groaning yesterday watching the film clips of children and mothers desperate to leave the Ukraine. I'm so thankful that Sin Relief, we've been able to serve over 60,000 individuals of those refugees on the Polish side, working with Polish Baptist churches. As we're groaning about it, but we, we're seeing how this, this is just not how it's supposed to be. Think about the groaning that occurs in a big storm, a tornado, a hurricane. In the fall, I was there in southern Louisiana after Hurricane Ida, 116 of our churches lost their facility. And because the news about Afghanistan quickly caused Hurricane Ida to be removed from the news, people quickly forgot. But it's been one of the roles of Sin Relief to challenge churches to be a partner of one of those churches that lost their facility and to send in volunteers, send in financial resources to help. We now have 111 churches committed to be a partner almost to that 116 level. Maybe some of you will be in a church that reaches out to the Louisiana Baptist Convention to help. And then the tornadoes in Kentucky, anybody that's ever been in or around a tornado knows the groaning sound of what occurs as metal and buildings are literally ripped apart. Creation groaning because things are not right. Think about when a family goes through great crisis. Think about when a marriage fails. Think about when serious sin is exposed. And how do we feel? It's just there's a groaning inside. This is not how things are supposed to be. And Paul goes on in verse 22 to say, It's like we suffer the pains of childbirth together until now to this very hour in history. Now, this is not original with the Apostle Paul. He gets this from Jesus. In Jesus' teaching in Matthew 24 and 25, that in-depth teaching about the signs of His coming, He compares it to birth pains. To childbirth. And I've got a confession to you. I know we live in a society that wants to be non binary when it comes to gender orientation, but I've never had a baby. And I don't know any man that's ever had a baby. I just don't think that's going to happen, even though I know we're supposed to be genderless in our society. But I've never had a baby. But my wife, Ann, has three. And, you know, as a husband, you learn something about birth pains, labor pains. When your wife has a baby. Now, for those of you who are of the millennial or Gen Z generation, I want you to know one thing about the baby boomer generation is that we felt like we had to have a class for everything. And even though mankind has had babies since Neanderthal man, we had to have a class for it. It was called Lamaze. So Ann and I went to Lamaze class to learn how to have a baby, even though it probably was going to happen anyway. And (laughs) they taught her how to breathe and they taught me how to care for her, to rub her back and Uh, She was in intense labor with the birth of our first son, George, who's now a pastor in Birmingham. And I had been rubbing her back for about an hour and a half. And I turned to Ann and I said, you know, this rubbing your back is wearing me out. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. The stupidest statement in the history of men. I mean, it was stupid. 
you see Ann, she's a lovely lady, a, a wonderful lady, but I mean, she looked at me with dagger eyes then. She was going through labor, and I'm talking about getting worn out from rubbing her back. That was one stupid statement. But here's this about labor pains. Now listen, are you listening? Don't miss this. When Ann would go into labor, at first she wasn't even sure she was going into labor. Felt kind of funny. Then she began to have some mild pains. They were very irregular. But the closer and closer she got to giving birth to our three sons, they became more regular, they became more intense, and they became more frequent. Now, please don't miss this in the great revelation of Jesus about his second coming and what Paul is referring to in labor pains. When Jesus talks about the signs of his second coming and he compares them to birth pains, those signs have been occurring all through the history of man. But the closer we get to the end of the age, the closer we get to Jesus' second coming, they're going to become more intense, more regular, and more frequent. And Paul is referring to the teaching of Jesus here. He's saying this creation groaning, this suffering we see in the world, it's kind of like childbirth together until now. But think about this with labor pains. When the baby is finally born, there is great joy that the mother feels in being able to hold that new child as she has brought new life into the world. And very quickly, the intensity and the difficulty of those labor pains begin to be forgotten with the joy of that new life. And Jesus uses this analogy so we'll have an understanding of how it will be when he comes for his church after the church has gone through very difficult days. It will quickly be forgotten because of the joy and the thanksgiving of being with the risen Lord and knowing that we're going to be with him forever. And that's what we need to keep in mind here so that we can have hope amidst earth pains in the creation. Look at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now understand, as a follower of Jesus Christ, all suffering is temporal. No suffering is eternal for the father, follower of Jesus Christ. Now it is for the person who rejects Christ and spends eternity in hell separated from God. But for the follower of Christ... It is temporal because we have a great hope. We have the hope of heaven and being with the Lord. When our physical body gives out and our soul is with the Lord in heaven, we have the hope of Christ coming in the future for his church. We have the hope of Christ coming in judgment on the evil of this world to destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet and those who are following him in those days. We have the hope of a kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven at this very hour in history. And that is a glorious hope that gives us strength in the temporary sufferings we feel. But that's not all. Go to verse 23. Not only this, but we ourselves also having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. What is this talking about? When you and I come to salvation through repentant faith in Jesus Christ, trusting that He is the Son of God that has paid the penalty for our sins on the cross and giving us something we don't deserve, that is forgiveness and righteousness with God. Not that we are, but because of the righteousness of Christ. And out of that, we also know that Christ has conquered sin and death, and we will as well. But there's another bonus of salvation, and that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit begins to shape our life through the teaching and preaching of the Word of God, through the study of the Word of God, to become more and more like Jesus in spirit and character. And that is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all the fruit that is described there. And that gives us great hope. Because we know how our heart and very often our actions have been. And now we have the fruit of the Spirit to empower us to become more and more like Jesus. And that gives us great hope. But that is not all. He talks about how we groan. Even though we find the ultimate answer in salvation in Jesus Christ, there is the groaning because as we look at the news about the Ukraine, as we see families disintegrating around us, as we go through 
pictures of and life situations where there is suffering and illness and pain and poverty, on and on. We groan because we know the world ain't like it's supposed to be. And there is a longing for it to be what God desires for, for it to be. And there is a longing for our adoption as sons. Now, that's a strange statement. We are adopted as a child of God at the moment of salvation. Why does it say that? Well, salvation has three parts. Hold on. I know you're going to say, oh, my goodness, heresy from the pulpit here at Midwestern. But there's the salvation when we come to repentant faith, accepting the grace of God through what Jesus has done on the cross and through his resurrection. We begin to be adopted as a child of God. But Paul says to work out your salvation. And he's talking about the sanctification process. He's talking about becoming more and more like Jesus, knowing that we still have the barnacles of sin and heart issues that we need to be cleansed of and shaped by. But there's a third aspect of salvation where the adoption as a child of God is complete, and that is when Jesus comes for his church. And we receive a new body. Look at what is said in verse 23, the redemption of our body. When Christ comes for His church, you can read about it in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17, but you can also read in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 that Jesus' resurrected body is the first fruits of what all of us receive one day. A new body that never gets sick, that never gets dead. That's glorious. Now, I don't know all that that new body is going to be like. You know, I'll tell you this because most of you are much younger than me. I hope that new body is not 69. You know, I'll take 20 or 25. That just, you know, that seems about the right age, the prime age for the new body. But we know this, it will be like Jesus' resurrected body, except in one way. Only he will have scars. On his hands, on his feet, on his side as an eternal reminder to all of us of the price he paid so that we could be saved and become an adopted child of God and receive these new resurrected bodies that do not get sick and do not die like him. And that will be glorious. But that is not all. Look at what Paul says in verse 24. For in hope we've been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we await eagerly for it. Hope amidst earth pains, hope amidst suffering is what we receive as followers of Jesus Christ. And that allows us to persevere amidst the deep anxiety and groanings of a fallen world and in the process, fulfill your ministry, my ministry, what God has called us to be and do. At Sin Relief, we're about serving the churches in fulfilling Christ's great commission through ministries of compassion. And the beauty of that is these type of ministries open the doors where traditional missionaries and ministers and Christians could not go through ministries of compassion, to hear the gospel. I remind our staff often, you know, we can help meet the temporary needs of suffering people on their journey to hell. But if we don't share the gospel, we are missing on helping out in the greatest need. We're not interested in being another humanitarian organization. We want to be distinctly Christ-centered, focused on the gospel. Because for any suffering person, temporary needs can be met, but the ultimate need is to be reconciled to God through what Jesus has done for us on the cross and through his resurrection. But as we're reminded today in this text, don't stop there. So many of my peers and the generations that follow in Bible-believing evangelical churches literally ignore the teachings of the events of the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's like stopping in the middle of the story. Don't forget the ultimate hope that we have, that one day, one day, when Christ returns, first for his church, then in judgment on evil on the face of the earth, he establishes his kingdom here on earth, and at last, now listen, are you listening? 
At last, things on earth will be as they are at this moment in eternity in heaven today. At last, the world will be what all of us are deep down inside longing for it to be. And to show you a brief picture, would you quickly turn, very quickly, turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11. Listen to these two verses in Isaiah 11, or three verses. Verse 6. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. How about that? And the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little boy will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox, and the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Isn't that amazing? Listen to these words from the prophet Micah. The prophet Micah, chapter 4, beginning... In verse 3, speaking of when Jesus reigns on earth as he is reigning in heaven at this moment in history. He will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. And listen to this. Listen now. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation, listen, imagine this. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they train for war. How glorious will that be? In the hope we have that gives us strength to persevere in the day-to-day groanings of a fallen creation so that we might continue to serve our fellow man and to share the gospel with our fellow man in hopes that they can receive salvation and begin to live with the hope that comes in knowing Jesus, our Lord, our King. And one day, here on earth, the kingdom of God will be as it is in heaven today. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, this fallen world causes us to groan with the earth pains that are everywhere. But we thank you, Father, for who you are, for what you have done in Jesus, and for what you are going to do in the future. Oh, Lord, by the power of you, the Holy Spirit, may you fill us afresh today with a fresh gratitude for Jesus, a fresh love for Jesus, a desire to follow Jesus, a desire to serve you by serving our fellow man and sharing with our fellow man the hope of the gospel, the good news in a world groaning from bad news. Thank you for this hope, Father. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.